Good morning, St. Mo's. My name is Sam. I'm one of the pastoral staff here, and uh, I get to share with you the Word of God this morning. And um, I'm stalling as I try to start this up. Okay. Good morning, St. Mo's. Uh, again, I'm glad to be here this morning to share and to worship and to hear from God's word. And we are in the midst of Advent. If you don't know what Advent is, it's four Sundays as we expectantly prepare and anticipate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. And so uh, we are in the midst of a four-part Advent series, and this is the third one today, uh, looking at Isaiah chapter, chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. Um, so let me, let me read that passage for us again uh, to refresh our memories. And before I do that, let me open with a word of prayer. And so I want to uh, invite you to uh, join in prayer for the Holy Spirit as we hear from God. Father, I pray that we may be open, open to hear from you this morning, and may we be eager to hear from your word, eager to hear words that may be difficult, eager to hear words of repentance, eager to hear words of assurance, eager to hear and obey. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So let me uh, read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. Um, wow, it's there. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, Whenever I, I read that and I hear that, um, it reminds me of, it's probably just me, all right, but when I was growing up, uh, we lived in this little um, city called Charlottesville in Virginia, and my dad would take our family, there's a lot of us, and I was little, I think like seven or eight years old, and we would go to this big hall, um, probably on the campus of UVA, and there would be an orchestra, and they would play Handel's Messiah. And then we would be in the audience, and we wouldn't just listen to this thing being played. We would sing along. I mean, this is a giant sing-along. There would be like a bouncing ball. No, there was no bouncing ball with the lyrics. But everyone would bring like um, a score of Handel's Messiah. If you've never heard that, it's, it's pretty big, and it's long. And so there would be four parts. Um, Soprano, tenor, alto, and bass. And uh, they would, the orchestra would play, and then you, everyone would sing along, like hundreds of people. I was small, so I thought there were like millions of people, but it's probably like not that many. But, um, you know, there would be this um, singing, and, you know, as a kid, my memories, as I look back, was like, why am I here? Dad dragged us out here. If you've ever heard Handel's Messiah, it's really long. There's a lot of people singing out of tune, and you're like, you're not singing the right note. Do you know how to read music? Um, and then I'm like, when is this going to end? But um, I share that story because it's as we hear Isaiah 9 again, as we hear God's word, we are not at a concert hall. 
listening, we are participants. We all get to sing. We all get to be a part as we hear from God's word, especially in Isaiah 9. And Pastor Ian has done an amazing job of unpacking it. I'm not going to do any of that. Um, if you want to do that, there's a thing called YouTube. You can go on our website and you can listen to the last two sermons. Um, here is Isaiah 9. There is a message for the nation of Israel in trouble. And God says, I'm going to show up. And here, here is the promise of the coming Savior, the Messiah, the King. These are the names. Wonderful Counselor. And today we're going to look at Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Mighty God. And we get to participate in that. So I want to unpack a couple of things. Not, not a lot, but just a couple of thoughts. And this morning, God may be impressing upon you as well. Maybe as, as we meditate on this, God is speaking even more powerfully in your life. So I want to be, I want to be sensitive and open to that as well. But here, I, I wanted to really highlight two things. This promised Messiah, this Savior of the world, the, the descriptor we have, Mighty God, is not just another description. It is a personal invitation. God, the mighty God, invites us personally. Um, so this is Christmas time, and so I don't know if you do this this year. I'm not sure if this is going to happen or not, but there's a whole, whole thing of, like, taking the right picture, finding the right website. For me, making sure you get the right discount because you don't want to get ripped off. But if you do it late, they're going to charge you a ton. And if you're lazy and you don't want to put stamps on, they'll do it for you. But this whole thing of like Christmas cards, right? So I'm late. I haven't started. I'm not sure if it'll get out there or not. But, you know, you send out Christmas cards. You receive Christmas cards. It's really cool. You get to see all your friends um, that have sent cards. And then you see how beautiful they are. Everyone just looks immaculate. Um, this year, I was thinking maybe we should just send a picture of us all like haggard, wearing our pajamas and picking our nose. Or, I don't know. That, I don't promise that. But, uh, <laughs> but every so often, you'll get a Christmas card that's like generic. I don't know if you ever get one of these, like from AT&T or Verizon. So, Thanks for being our customer. We, we really appreciate your business. And it's like signed from the CEO of the company. I'm like, wow, the CEO of the company sent me this, and I open it, and clearly it's like just a digitized signature. It's not actually the CEO who sat there and signed a bajillion Christmas cards, right? Because they just print it out. Versus getting a card from your friend who sent a card, and there's a little note in the back, and say, hey, I hope you're doing well. We're praying for you. We love you. Sign so-and-so. I share that because this, the description of this coming Messiah as the mighty God is not just a generic mighty God. It is a personal invitation mighty God. And I don't want to nerd out too much here, but usually the mighty God in the Bible is almighty God. I know you're like, mighty God, almighty, is, is that a big deal? Well, in Hebrew, it's actually two different words. And some of you know the word for almighty God. It's El Shaddai. Uh, if you grew up in the 80s, there was a famous song, El Shaddai. I'm not going to sing it for you. You can Google it. But that's El Shaddai, the mighty, almighty God. This is like the, this is a powerful theological academic word. The almighty, omniscient, all-powerful, the sufficiency of God, the sovereignty of God. That's like this 
huge theological El Shaddai. Here, that's not the word. This is El Gabor. This is the mighty God, the warrior God, the one who shows up just at the right time for you and for me and does the right thing and saves the day, saves us, delivers us personally. When we are in trouble, this is El Gabor. God shows up. Zephaniah 3 says it, right? The Lord God who is with you, the mighty God, El Gabor, is mighty to save. That's the one. This is a personal signature. The Messiah is a personal mighty God who shows up in my life, in your life, to save us. And in this Advent season, we mull on that. God showed up to the nation of Israel, saved them. God sent his only son, Jesus, who came in meekness and humility, born as a baby in a manger on Christmas Day, who saves the world and who personally says, I will come again. I'm coming to those who are in trouble, who are troubled in their soul, who are afflicted, those who are in need. I am coming. It's an invitation for you, for you, for me, for us. And that's a gift. It's a gift during this Advent season. And then I'm going to end it there. No. <laughs> I, I just have one more, one more story and one more thought. Um, it's an invitation, but it's also an inv invitation to remember. Um, I, I share this story with trepidation because I have family that are listening and watching. So please don't text or call me afterwards. <laughs> um, but you know, um, there's like this DNA in me that's cheap. So when I can, I will try to save money, even if it's a dollar. And so obviously, uh, when it's more than a dollar, I'm like, of course I will do it. And so, you know, one of the joys of car ownership is that it breaks down. And so um, I had an opportunity to save a ton of money doing my own brake rotors, brake pads. And some of you are like, whoa, that's a big deal. It's actually not that hard. You know, there's like six screws. You just have to find the right um, tool and screw to get it off. But once you do that, you know, the thing comes off, you put it back on, and then that's it. And you save hundreds of dollars. Um, so it took a, a couple of weeks to do this instead of a couple hours. But, you know, I did it. And I did all four tires. And I was so happy and so proud of myself. And so after, you, if, if you've ever done this yourself, you, you do it. And then you've got to make sure that you did it right. Right, so you, after you do it, you make sure you got to pump the brake because if you just start driving, the, uh, the brake hydraulics haven't kicked in. And so if you drive, you'll just go right through your house. So you <laughs> start the engine and then you pump the brakes and then you'll feel the hydraulic resistance and you're like, yes. So you, you start to drive off very slowly to make sure your car is not going to explode or the wheels fall off. And sure enough, it doesn't. And so you drive around the block, and then you park back at your house, and then you look at your magnificent work. And then the thought of saving $100. Yes, I've, I have done this. Right. And uh, just as a hypothetical, let's say you are now driving with your kids in the car, merrily, merrily, 
driving them to from school and activities and then you're coming back home and then you hear a thumping and a jiggling and a jangling and you're like did I hit a squirrel and you pull into your house and you feel a little shaking and you're like that's not right that couldn't be right and this is purely hypothetical this is this is this did not happen to me I'm just saying hypothetically so you you stop the car and you've almost made it to your house but just as precaution you stop the car and you get out of the car and then you look and your worst nightmare has come true the back tire has fallen off. Well, it's still hanging on. There's five lug nuts. Two of them are hanging on. Like, Lord Jesus, please. Right? These, these lug nuts are hanging on to this wheel for dear life. And it's off. But it's on. Thank God. But it doesn't look right. And it's in the middle of the night. And so the first thing... The first thought is, dear God, thank you. Now, kids, run into the house. Don't tell mom what happened. <laughs> All right? And I run to the garage. I mean, I didn't run, but this is a hypothetical story, right? So I run to the garage, and th hypothetically, there is a five-ton jack. But if you've ever had these five-ton hydraulic jack to jack up the car so that you can take the tire off, you got to drag this thing. But I'm not thinking clearly. Well, hypothetical Sam is not thinking clearly. And so you drag it in the middle of the night in the asphalt of your neighborhood, which makes a tremendously loud racket. So now all your neighbors are running out and saying, what is going on? Is somebody stealing Sam's car? I'm like, no, it's me. I'm stealing my own car. No, I'm not stealing. Everybody just go back into your house. It's a, it's a nothing burger. So I drag this jack and quickly jack up the back, take the two lug nuts that are hanging on for dear life, and your heart is pounding because you're saying, dear Lord, I saved $100, but did I just cause $2,000 worth of damage to the back axle? So you take the back tire off, and with the tiny little flashlight that is on your iPhone, and you're looking desperately, and everything is okay. Oh, dear God. It's all right. And now you are in the arduous task of finding the three other lug nuts. <laughs> so now your neighbors, you can tell, you know, I don't know if you, this is hypothetical, obviously, but you may have neighbors, one of those neighbors that's always looking out the window, right? That neighbor's looking out the window because you're walking around the middle of the neighborhood street with this tiny little iPhone flashlight looking for three lug nuts. And by God's grace, you find it. And you put the wheels back on. And you make sure that you torque the crap out. <laughs> you, you torque that thing really tight so this never happens again. What a story. This is a really hypothetical story. Uh, um, and I share that story because imagine if as you were driving off, that neighbor ran out and said, yo, Sam, you forgot to torque that back lug nuts. I'm like, of course I did. I didn't forget. And just by chance, you go, and it's loose. What a relief. You know, some things that we forget to remember, they're not big deals, right? My youngest son, he always has a wonderful joke he wants to tell me. But then as soon as he's about to say it, he's like, I can't remember. <laughs> right? It is a big deal for him, but, it, you know, it's not a big deal. It'll come back. Some things that we forget to remember are inconvenient. Like if you walk out of the house and you forget your phone. I don't know if you've ever done that, but it's like something is missing in your life. Where is my phone? It's an inconvenience, but it's not a big deal. But some things, 
some things, when we forget to remember, it gets us in big trouble. Like forgetting someone's birthday or an anniversary. <laughs> no, right? They have major consequences. Like this hypothetical story. Literally, the wheels of your cars will come off going 70 miles an hour on I-83. That's a big deal. And I think in this Advent season, this descriptor of the coming Messiah, the mighty God, we get this gift from our God to say, hey, don't forget to remember God is our Savior. He's the, not only the Savior of the world, but he has saved each and every one of us. Those of us who have leaned the weight of our lives, we know that, right? And those of you who are seeking, I want to let you know that that is the mighty God personally inviting each one of you to remember Jesus is the Savior of our lives, the Savior of the world. And today we get to go to the Lord's table. That's a cue for whoever is, I think it's Beth, Beth um, to get ready for the Lord's table and also the worship team. Um, as we go to the Lord's table today, there. This is, a, this is a personal invitation. The mighty God invites us personally. The mighty God reminds us, helps us to remember. Maybe we've forgotten during this busy Christmas holiday. We're busy doing a lot of other things. But we get this gift. Gift of slowing down. Gift of preparing gift of reflection, gift of expectation, of anticipating, of remembering that we have a God, the mighty God, who is our Savior. So as we go before the Lord's table, and I'm going to turn it over to Beth, would we do this today in prayer? And in reflection, what has God revealed to us this morning about God, about ourselves, and maybe what is the Holy Spirit challenging each one of us as we go before the Lord's table, let's bring our prayers to God this morning.